Okay, lads and ladies, welcome back to Calc 2. I um, it's it's lovely to be with you here today. I'm grateful that <clears throat> I don't have to uh, lose contact with you guys all together just due to this. But it is kind of tragic that you know just a few weeks into our first in-person class in two years, we're back to this bullshit. So um, here we are. We're going to go ahead and continue with class just like we would normally. The only difference being now I'm doing it the way we were doing it in the fall. So if you're with me in the fall, this is going to be familiar. If you were not with me in the fall, then um, maybe this is familiar from other things. I have a document camera set up here at my home workstation, and we're going to um, to run class like this. So um, I will show you how we're going to do the notes. And then today we're going to begin talking about something new. It's actually a really I'm, I'm extra disappointed that today is the day we had to do this switch because the content for today is, is really, really cool stuff. Um, I mentioned in each of your honors interviews that this class is kind of made up of three parts, right? The first part is all about integration. The second part is all about convergence. And the third part is um, kind of applications and different coordinate systems and things like that. So uh, we're beginning what is by far the most important part of this class, which is the oh, my dog's really enjoying scratching himself, which is the part on convergence. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to kind of introduce the concepts really gently here and the terminology and stuff like that. Um, but let's just go ahead and get into it. Um, this, of course, is MAC2312, section number OH1, which is Calc 2 honors. Uh, and the date today is, is what, the 10th? 9th, sorry, 2-9. 22. And today, uh, we'll have many sections on convergence, but today we're going to cover section 7.8, uh, which is on improper integrals. And those are the first kind of mathematical objects we're going to meet where the question, does this converge or not, um, is, is relevant. So uh, that's improper, as in not proper integrals. Uh, it might sound a little bit silly. This is section 7.8, by the way. It might sound a little bit silly to classify an integral as not proper because we've never called any other integrals proper. Um, but, but basically what it means is that there's something wrong with these integrals. Uh, something <clears throat> in some cases quite obvious and in other cases quite subtle. Um, but I do just want to make a little note that this is the beginning. Day marks the start of our unit on convergence. And that word convergence or converge, besides being an excellent 90s, uh, I don't even know what the genre you would call them, I guess like hardcore punk band, besides, <clears throat> besides converge being an excellent 90s hardcore punk band, is also a term that's used in regular English language to mean come together, right? Um, <clears throat> in Robert Frost's poem, uh, you know, Two Words Diverge in a Yellow Wood, he's, um, he's, diverge is the antonym for converge, he's, he's saying these, this road splits into two and goes off separately. And converge means the two things coming together to form one. In mathematics, it means something slightly different, but you can kind of uh, contextualize it a little bit. In essence, the, the simplest way I can say is that um, first, converge is a verb. The word converge is something that happens. Uh, and it, it generally, it means an infinite process leading to a finite result. So I might tell you <laughs> that something or some other thing um, converged, right? And that means that that thing had some sort of infinite process going on. And because I describe it as converging, that infinite process led to a finite result, um, <clears throat> an un <clears throat> excuse me, unambiguous finite result. Um, so converge is the verb. Convergent is the adjective.
And this is just an object which converges. And then <clears throat> the opposite of each of these is diverge and divergent. Um, so I won't, you know, it's not an English class. I'm not going to spend any more time on it than that. Um, but the opposite to these. Diverge, which is the verb form. And divergence, which is the adjective form. Okay. Uh, we will study <clears throat> improper integrals as objects which may converge or diverge. Uh, yeah, I hate that. That's the worst. Um, <laughs> don't get me started, man. Um, we will study many objects which could converge or diverge. Improper integrals <clears throat> are a part of that class of things, right? They have this ability to converge. They have this ability to diverge. The other objects we'll study with that sort of property are series um, and sequences. And then within series, we're going to study several very special kinds of series, like power series and Fourier series. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so when you hear the word converge, first be aware it's a verb. And when you use these words, please try to use them um, in a way that is grammatically correct. So if, if you hear the word converge, it, it means something is happening, right? Specifically, some process is leading to a finite result. And that process has the potential to not lead to a finite result. And you hear the word convergent, that means we're talking about an object that has that property, right? That, that the finite process within was um, successful, led to, a, led to a finite result. <clears throat> That's finite, that infinite process within led to a finite result. OK. <clears throat> I don't, we don't even know what the hell we're talking about. So let me go ahead and give you um, a nice, simple, motivating example. Um, things can only be so simple here, but We've been talking a lot about integrals, and we're comfortable with the idea that an integral measures an area, right? So imagine that I want to find all the area. under the curve f of x equals 1 over x squared um, to the right of x equals 1. It might seem like a strange question. Why would you want to do that? <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to just kind of go with it for a minute. Um, and you know, trust that it is something that I, I might want to do. So to get a feel for what, what we're even asking here. Is it to take into account the asymptote? Um, sort of. So one over x squared has a pair of asymptotes. And one of them is, is in a sense, relevant here. Um, so one over x squared has that vertical asymptote at 0, at x equals 0. And then he tucks off to the right like this, and there's a, a horizontal asymptote over here, the line y equals 0. Um, and that they are, in a sense, both relevant to the problem. Um, the fact that this function tends to 0 as x gets large is important, but we'll, we'll get to that. So if I mark this as 1, and I say here is x equals 1, then what I'm looking for, I'm going to use pencil to shade this because I don't want to clutter things too terribly in here. What I'm looking for is not the area from like one to two, which you know might be like this, not the area from one to five. I want all the area. So I'm going to go forever and ever and ever on in off to the right. <clears throat> and it's not terribly hard to imagine what could go wrong here. This region is infinitely wide. So it's certainly possible that this area is not finite. 
So in the case of, a, of an improper integral, which will be the, the name for the thing we set up to find this, converging would mean that the area measured is finite. <clears throat> So how do I do this? I'd like to point out that you cannot set up a Riemann sum. So intuitively, this could be thought of as, uh, let me call the, no, oh, let's say the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared dx, <clears throat> right? Because the, the left bound for this region is one, but there is no right bound, right? It just keeps going and going and going and going. So it makes some notational sense, right? To just say, okay, well, that's the integral from one to infinity. Uh, the, the real problem here is that you cannot set up a Riemann sum for an integral like this. <clears throat> so <clears throat> okay. all of the integrals that we've done so far involve continuous functions and a finite interval, right? Like the function doesn't have any asymptotes, vertical asymptotes. Uh, and we're integrating from you know, some finite number A to some finite number B. The machinery that we use to define such an integral, right? Such an integral we call a Riemann integral. And you may remember in Calc 1, there were these criterion for these, this integrability was the word. And we said, well, if your function is piecewise continuous, then, then it is an integrable function. There is a meaningful way to talk about the area bounded by that function on some finite interval. The way that you define such an integral is through a Riemann sum. All of the integrals are defined through Riemann sums. And if you remember in Calc 1, when we proved the fundamental theorem of calculus, we relied on Riemann sums to prove that, right? We, we ended up showing that the integral from A to B of little f is capital F of B minus capital F of A by setting up a Riemann sum to represent that integral and then doing a bunch of work and in the end taking a limit using the squeeze theorem and getting what we wanted out. Why? Could I not construct a Riemann sum for this integral? What about this integral inhibits the construction of a Riemann sum? Or which step in that construction is impossible here? Oh, Jesus, dude. Watch out. Has it worked? Can n not equal infinity? Is that not allowed? Um, <clears throat> well, in the definition of the Riemann integral, so let me go ahead and say here, recall the integral from a to b of little f of x dx was defined as the limit as n goes to infinity sigma i from 1 to n f of xi, or maybe xi star, if you were using some strange sample points times delta x, <clears throat> where delta x was b minus a over n, and xi, if we're using right end points, was a plus i delta x. Kitty, we kind of love you. You can't be cute. Oh my god. All right, you guys sort it out yourselves. Get the fuck out. Uh, could you move the notes up slightly? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Well, we've banished the animals. Um, <clears throat> so remember that the definite integral of f, the integral from a to b of little f of x dx, is defined to be the limit of this Riemann sum here, right? This object was called the Riemann sum for f from a to b. Um, and delta x, we calculate as b minus a over n. That's the upper bound minus the lower bound divided by the number of rectangles you are using. 
It was the width of the little sub intervals. And then xi, those were your sample points. And if we're using right endpoints, then that's just a plus i times delta x. One of these things, if you just start trying to plug in for this integral, has a real problem. Which Can you calculate delta x if b is infinity? Very good. Yeah, if b is infinity, then delta x is like for here, that would be infinity minus one over n. That's a problem, right? That's a real problem. Geometrically, what we were doing when we cooked up delta x, we said we're going to take the interval a to b and chop it up into n equal length subintervals, right? And then each one of those would be the base of a rectangle. Well, this delta x. We cannot define delta x for an integral where a is infinity or b is infinity. I mean, in the best, bravest sense, you could say, OK, well, that just means delta x is infinity. But that's a fucking problem, because now every one of your Riemann rectangles has infinite width. Uh oh. Um, <clears throat> and any rectangle with infinite width would automatically have infinite area. That's that's a, a big issue. This might not seem like a big deal at first because you say, okay, well, when I do integrals, I don't write down Riemann sums. I find an antiderivative and I plug in some bounds. But the whole reason you can take an antiderivative and plug in bounds is the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus was proven using Riemann sums. So since specifically we're using FTC2 there, right? The second fundamental theorem of calculus. Since FTC2 is proved by Riemann sums, and integrals like these, cannot have Riemann sums, we can't use FTC. The fundamental theorem of calculus is dead in the water here because it's leaning on something that doesn't exist. Right? That's bad. FTC leans on Riemann sums. If you don't have a Riemann sum, you don't have FTC. So even though we never write down the Riemann sums explicitly <clears throat> when we're solving an integral, we are implicitly using it. And it gets worse. U sub, integration by parts, trig sub, partial, for all the shit that we've done is dependent upon the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? All of those things were things that we did to get to an antiderivative. And then with that antiderivative, we'd plug and bounce. That's FTC2. So what we need is a little hack. <clears throat> We need some way to take this big problem and fracture it into littler problems, hopefully one of which we can apply our FTC2 logic to. This is not as hard as it might seem, but it does require a smidge of creativity. Uh, to my knowledge, <clears throat> the first person to do this carefully was Carl Weierstrass. Uh, although I suspect Koshi had the idea. So here's the big idea. Don't go for, don't go after all the area at once. Find a formula. for the area from x equals 1 to x equals b. And this we will do the normal way using FTC2. Then take the limit as b goes to infinity. 
That's the that's the genius move. And the picture here. I'm just going to draw quadrant one because that's really all we care about for this. Sure, I want all the area. That's my that's my goal. That's pen. I want all the area, but instead of going after all the area at once, I'm going to introduce a variable. And your book, I think, uses the letter little b. I always use capital R. Everybody uses whatever the hell they want. Um, and say, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to integrate from 1 up to b. This being a, a finite interval, I can apply my fundamental theorem of calculus to, right? I can use FTC2 to calculate this pencil shaded area here. Then once I have a formula for that, and it will depend on B, right? At the end of this, you will have some Bs in your answer. Then you send B to infinity. So instead of calling this one over X squared, let me, let me just call this a, a generic function F of X. Of course, it doesn't have to be one either. Um, then this area here is the integral from 1 to b of f of x dx. And all the area to the right of 1 would be the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b of f of x dx. That's the genius move here. <clears throat> so each of these problems is going to start off like a regular kind of integral, just the difference being maybe one of your bounds instead of being a, a concrete number is going to be a a variable or a symbol of your choosing. And then after you compute that integral, you'll have to take a limit. We remember from Calc 1 that limits, sometimes they exist, sometimes they don't exist. Sometimes they're finite, sometimes they're not finite. And those different cases will determine whether we refer to the original integral from 1 to infinity as convergent or divergent. All right. So we've got a rough idea here. Let me execute this for the problem we started discussing, and then I'll give you the general definition. This is one of two ways an integral can be improper. Um, this sort of thing we're talking about here where the region is infinitely wide, like one of your bounds is infinity or negative infinity, those are called type one integrals. I'll split everything, or I'll break everything down and put it in a table for you a little later, but for now, um, let's just make sure we've kind of got this idea in our head that instead of integrating from one all the way out to infinity, I'm going to integrate from one up to b, find a formula for that, then send b to infinity in that formula. It might seem like a, a trivial difference, but it's really not. Questions so far? OK. So I'm going to do this um, This problem we talked about, the area under 1 over x squared to the right of 1. Oh, screen is still all messed up. OK. So this is what we said we want. We want the area under 1 over x squared to the right of 1. That's the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. <clears throat> and I propose that the, the hack we can use to let us do our normal integration thing is to write this as the limit 
as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared dx. And this is actually the definition of the improper integral. The limit is written first, but it's going to be the last thing that we do. We need to clean up, evaluate this integral, and then at the end, we'll take the limit. But we got to write the limit at every step. Um, so 1 over x squared, that's x to the negative 2. If you integrate x to the negative 2, you get negative 1 over x. So this is negative 1 over x evaluated from 1 to b. Maxwell. Lose my mind. I can evaluate that antiderivative between the bounds we have, still writing my limit up front. So if I plug in b for x here, I get negative 1 over b. And then I need to subtract from that what I get when I plug in 1. So that's negative 1 over b minus negative 1 over 1. Um, nobody would write it that way, though. It's 1 minus 1 over b. And take a second, convince yourself. Negative 1 over b minus negative 1 over 1. That's negative 1 over b plus 1, which just looks so much better like this. And now as b goes to infinity, what does 1 over b do? Zero. Yeah, 1 over b goes to 0. Right, one divided by infinity is zero. And there's a theorem running in the background there that I just want to remind you of. Uh, I'll write it in terms of the variable x, the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x to the p this is equal to zero for any positive number p. All right, so the one over b, this is like one over x to the one. So p is going to go to zero. <clears throat> and in general, anytime you have something like this, you'll get zero. Uh, limits at infinity are going to be a big, big deal for us in this section, for us in the next. 13 sections, All right? So limits at infinity, that section 2.6 in your textbook, if that is feeling distant uh, and, and you don't remember it right away, I will try to ramp up gently, right? Not, not dumping too much crazy stuff on you right now, but we're gonna use all the tricks from Calc 1. Squeeze theorem, Locutal's rule, all of it. Okay, so the area under one over x squared from one to infinity is one. We look in Desmos. Rather than going up to infinity, let me do it like this. Add a five for B. So uh, and let me add the graph y equals one over x squared. And we'll say, uh, actually, I should use F. Okay. And then my B slider, let me change this one slide. Right. So this is moving a little quick. Let me slow it down for you. But if we look at the area under there, just from one to two, we get one half. If you look at the area under there from one to four, you get 0.75 or three quarters. If you look at the area under there from one to six, you get 0.83333. If I let this go further and further and further, so we're getting more and more, you can see the purple stops here, right? So we're still not looking at all of it. That's 0.92. And as I send B out further and further and further and further, this number right here is getting closer and closer and closer to one. And in the limit, we would say it is exactly one. So that's the idea behind what's going on. So, 
So if you want a picture that you can put in your head to go with these problems, this is the picture, right? We're not actually finding all the area in a single step. We're finding a formula for the area up to some finite variable. And then we're going to take the limit as that variable goes to infinity. I love this one. This is good shit. I wish I had this when I was a student. All right. So um, theorems like this, all the theorems on limits at infinity from Calc 1 are going to be a big deal. Let me go ahead and formally define for you the thing we just did. This is called a type one improper integral. If f of x is continuous on the interval a to infinity, then we can define the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx sign slot the integral symbol as the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from a to b of f of x dx. <clears throat> and the object here, the integral from a to b of f of x dx is a normal Riemann integral. So you can use all of your normal Riemann integration tricks, including integration by parts and trig sub and all that good stuff. So that's the big idea. We're going to take this thing that we don't have FTC with reduce it down to a limit and a thing that we do have FTC with. Um, these are called type one integrals, where this one of these bounds is infinity. Uh, an important thing here, the continuity condition. Function must be continuous. We're going to talk about how to handle discontinuities when we talk about type two improper integrals. And that's it. There's only two. There's no type three. So don't panic. Um, but while I'm here, while I'm here, your book only does this. I'd just like to go on a little bit further to say if you had the integral from negative infinity to b of f of x dx, you can do the same sort of shit. This would be limit as a goes to negative infinity, integral a to b of f of x dx. But here I'm assuming the function is continuous from negative infinity up to b. Right, your book doesn't put this in the same place because they don't want you to conflate the hypotheses. Um, but in either case, you need the function to be continuous over the domain that you're trying to integrate. That's that's all. Questions on the definition or how it connects to the example we did? Um, quick question. Does it also have to be smooth or does it not have to be? Good question. Um, does not have to be smooth. No. Uh, the, so this is a, a C1 restriction, um, <clears throat> not, a, not a C2 restriction. Don't need to be continuously differentiable, just continuous. That's a fun question. So like I could do this with the absolute value function if I wanted. Right? I could integrate the absolute value function from negative 1 to infinity using this effect if I like and going over that spot where I'm not smooth. No problem. OK, so that's our definition. Let's try something Let's 
try something. Oh, there's so many fun things to do. I, I guess we should try with the full formality. Um, evaluate student integral from negative one to infinity of one over one plus x squared dx. Uh, this graph, this is not a, a graph from your like known graphs, right? This isn't something that I necessarily require you to know coming into the class, but I would like to draw it for you because it is an important one. Uh, you know that's the derivative of the inverse tangent function. So the integral is going to be easy. The uh, antiderivative step will not be challenging, but here's what she looks like. And we're trying to integrate from negative one all the way up to infinity. To find this area. Uh, the function is continuous from negative one to infinity, right? If one plus x squared factored, if this had any real roots that lived to the right of negative one, we'd have a problem because then that function would not be continuous. Um, but it is, right? One plus x squared has only the two imaginary roots, positive i and negative i. <clears throat> so I can go ahead and say, by the definition of the type one improper integral, the integral I want is equal to, I'll do it like this so my hand doesn't cover, is equal to the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from negative one up to b of one over one plus x squared dx. And now this object, right, if I, I think of b as being some number right here, this object is calculating the purple area. And as b goes to infinity, the purple area becomes the pencil area. Antiderivative for 1 over 1 plus x squared is the inverse tangent function. The integrals in this section are not are not hard, right? The antiderivative step don't doesn't tend to be especially hard because the point is to wrap your head around um, the convergence and divergence of the integral. So this is the limit as b goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of b minus the inverse tangent of negative one. So um, one thing at a time, what is the inverse tangent of negative one? That's just- What are the restrictions for inverse tangent? Uh, arc tangent, so tangent is, is restricted to negative pi over two to pi over two to make it one to one. And then the inverse tangent function, his domain is all real numbers. His range is negative pi over two to pi over two. So the restriction there is uh, negative pi over two to pi over two. So I'm looking for an angle between negative pi over two and pi over two, such that the tangent of that angle is negative one. Negative pi over four. Excellent. Yeah, the tangent of negative pi over four is negative one. And it is true that negative pi over four is between negative pi over two and pi over two. So this is the limit as b goes to infinity of 
the inverse tangent of b minus negative pi over 4, so plus pi over 4. All right. <clears throat> and then what is that limit? As b goes to infinity, obviously the pi over 4 piece isn't affected. That's a constant. But the inverse tangent of b is the, the piece we need to think about. What does this piece do as b, the inside, goes to positive infinity? It goes towards pi over 2. Very good. Very good, right? Inverse tangent goes to pi over 2 as its inside goes to infinity. This is pi over 2 plus pi over 4. Uh, it's 2 pi over 2, right? Or, sorry, 2 pi over 4. So 2 pi over 4 plus 1 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4. So this integral, which is an improper integral, yielded through this infinite process, right, this, this uh, limiting process, the finite value 3 pi over 4. In other words, the area here, the pencil shaded area, which we're getting as the limit of the purple area, is finite. So a little bit of language stuff. Uh, if the limit defining an improper integral exists and is finite, I need both of those things to be true. Then we say come on, Ted. We say the improper integral converges. And if not, otherwise. We say the improper integral diverges. Right? And this is for improper integrals, the definition of converge and diverge. <clears throat> the, those words, like I said, have meaning in other contexts too. But in each context, you need to specify what those words mean. So for an improper integral, what it means to converge, every improper integral is defined as a limit, right? Improper integral, limit of a proper integral. So if the limit which defines the improper integral exists, meaning you don't run into any like uh, left-right limit issues or rapid oscillation um, exists and is finite, then we say the integral converges. Otherwise, right, if either of those things fail, either the limit doesn't exist or the limit comes out to be infinite, then we'd say the improper integral diverges. So this integral, I would say, converges converges. Uh, and the language here we say converges to. 3 pi over 4. Um, there are a bunch of different, <clears throat> different ways you can try to phrase this, um, but that's the, the standard language. It converges to 3 pi over 4. All right, any questions on this guy? Cool. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at one more improper integral like this. We started with the calculation of all the area under 1 over x squared to the right of 1. Um, you might wonder why I didn't start with 1 over x.
Hold on, let me make that clear. My graph of one over x, you know, I like I like to draw the pictures. It's not always necessary, but it's often wise. Graph of one over x looks a lot like the graph of one over x squared, right? He does this sort of thing and this sort of thing. I'm integrating from one to infinity. So what we're after is all the area under this curve to the right of one. Very, very similar looking to the first problem, right? In fact, I'd like to point something out. What feature have you noticed is shared by all three functions so far? They're symmetrical. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, they all, I guess that's a, a broad question. I need to narrow it down a little bit. They do all have certain symmetries. All the functions I've chosen so far were either even or odd functions, um, but they don't have the same symmetries. Thinking about asymptotes, think about all three functions, what asymptotic feature do they all share? X-axis? Yeah, they all approach the x-axis as you wander off to the right. It turns out that that is a necessary, not sufficient, but necessary condition for these integrals to converge. And this guy provides a neat uh, counter example to the incorrect belief that having that asymptote automatically means you converge. Uh, we will, we'll talk much more about that a little bit down the road. Here for us right now, we're just trying to get used to the stuff. So let's go ahead and set it up. We know that the integral from one to infinity of anything is the limit as b goes to infinity, integral one to b of that thing. And then you know, we always continue writing our limit. Don't get sloppy about this. Use good notation. The integral from 1 to b of 1 over x dx. Well, I know the antiderivative for 1 over x that we use is always natural log absolute value of x. And that's being evaluated from 1 to b. And if I evaluate that between bounds, then I can start thinking about my limit. This would be the natural log of the absolute value of b minus the natural log of, I'll just write one because one is positive. We know that the natural log of one is zero. And we're sending b to positive infinity. So b is definitely considered a positive number here. I don't need to worry about the absolute values there. So this is lim b to infinity, natural log of b. Right, throughout this, we're assuming that b not only is b positive, we're assuming b is bigger than one. This one is here. Now we imagine chopping here at b, right? So what is this limit? Infinity? Yeah, it is. It's infinity. It's not immediately obvious. This doesn't follow from the theorem I showed you a minute ago. The natural log functions graph can be a bit deceptive depending on how you're looking at it. All right, here's the graph, one equals natural log of, I'll write it as b, and we can just say this is the b-axis. Because it has that concave down shape, you might think that it, it has some finite limit, that there's a, a horizontal asymptote for this guy. Um, but there isn't. There isn't. As you go further and further over this way, he goes up, 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 and up. And he is unbounded. Um, it takes him a long time to get to infinity, but he gets to infinity. So this is. this slow growth is unbounded. So that limit, that is infinity. And this is another thing that you might want to tuck into your brain along with that theorem that we had a second ago, the blue theorem. 
the, the natural log function, while it, it grows slowly, it does continue growing and it, it does not um, never gets sandwiched down by anything. You give me any horizontal line, this thing will eventually poke through that line. It might take a long ass time, but it will. <clears throat> All right, so that's our calculation step done. What would you, how would you describe this integral? The improper integral we started with. What, what would be the appropriate language to describe it? That's divergent. Very good. Yeah, this integral is divergent. Or you could say, That the integral diverges, or actually, you could also say, or you can say it is divergent. That's it. Now, there are other ways that integrals can diverge, right? But this is sort of the most common one. Uh, the area just fails to be finite. Questions on this guy? All right. So those are type one improper integrals. They're integrals where the area being measured is infinitely wide. And if you have an infinitely wide region, that area could be finite, could be infinite. I want to show you one more quick example. And then we're going to talk about type two integrals. I need to watch the time here. I so you go. Keep track of any setting. Um, I'm just going to write it. Let's say integral from um, zero to infinity of time squared of x. Uh, again, type one improper integral because the upper bound is infinity. So I'll say, okay, that's limit b to infinity. Um, you know what? Let me get rid of the square. I'm just going to scratch that square off. We're going to do it without the square. Right, sine squared, I think, is one of your homework problems. So this would be limit b to infinity integral zero to b just sine x dx, which is limit b to infinity. You know your antiderivative for sine is negative cosine, negative cos of x. And this needs to be evaluated from 0 to b. And that is the limit as b goes to infinity of negative cos of b minus, when you plug in zero, you get cosine of zero is one, so negative one. In other words, this is one b to infinity, one minus cosine of b. Uh, which is a little funny. Obviously, the one doesn't care about the limit, right? One is constant. But the cosine of b, what does that do as b goes to infinity? It also does. It's an interesting question. So let me let me come back here and modify this just a little bit. There we go. Oh, and um, oh, let's see, can I do it like this? Well, no, it doesn't like that. It's only measuring the positive parts here, which is a problem. Maybe if I say, no, that's not going to work either. Um, how would you describe that? Maybe if I also did infinite plus one minus zero. Yeah. Okay. As well, and also from um, three. Uh, oh, we're going from zero. Okay, here we go. 
So uh, as B gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we're looking at, at something like this, right? And I want to know what's going on with that area. There's a sense in which we'd like to say for every bloop up here, there's a bloop down here, and maybe they cancel. But we know that if you actually find this area as a function of b, you get 1 minus cosine of b. So let me write just y equals 1 minus cos of x here. So the red function is the area up to a given point on the, on the blue function, on, on the green function, right? that purple area. And you see it does even out to zero sometimes. Every time you've gone through a full up cycle and a full down cycle, this comes back to zero. But as you start going through another up cycle, right, like here, the red function becomes positive again. It maximizes after you've gone through the full up cycle. And then it starts to come back down as you go through one of the down cycles. And it goes on like that forever. Absent all this other shit, what we're really trying to do is take the limit of the red function, right? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to calculate this limit. The limit of the cosine function on its own, yeah, does not exist. Sarah's comment in the chat is correct. The cosine of b will bounce back and forth from one to negative one, but it never settles down, right? This limit does not exist. Remember, limits at infinity are the same as horizontal asymptotes. Does the red function have a horizontal asymptote? No. No, he just keeps bouncing back and forth, back and forth, no matter how far out I go. He's never going to calm down. So in this case, the limit defining the improper integral does not exist. Or DNE stands for does not exist. So we would also call this a divergent integral. Right. So we say, if the limit defining the integral exists and is finite, then the integral converges. If either of those conditions fail, then the integral diverges. Here, it's the existence criteria that failed. So we would still call this a divergent integral. Neat, huh? Uh, there are ways to, to change how you're thinking about them change how you're thinking about these objects, such that you would say this integral maybe has value 0 because there's equal weight above and below the x-axis. Um, but that requires much more sophisticated tools than we have so far. Um, so that's, that's the basic story for type 1 integrals. I want to talk for a second about type 2 integrals now. We, we haven't yet, and that's an important part of the section. I'm going to do that by asking a question. What's weird about the integral from 1 to 3 of 1 over x minus 2 dx? doesn't appear to have a, a real problem right away, right? 1 and 3 are finite numbers. 1 over x minus 2 is a rational function. It's a reasonable function. And let's look at the graph of 1 over x minus 2. That's a translated or shifted version of 1 over x. If I shift 1 over x to the right by 2 units, Well, then that vertical asymptote, which used to be at x equals 0, is now here at 2. So 
So the area in question, there are problems. I'll mark this as three. Because of that vertical asymptote, it is possible that this area is infinite also. Right? This area goes up forever and ever here, goes down forever and ever there. Instead of being infinitely wide, this region is infinitely tall. And we can run into the same sort of problems with an infinitely tall region than we can with an infinitely wide region. So the, the answer here, um, answer, the region whose area is measured by that integral is infinitely tall. Hence, the total area may or may not be finite. In terms of Riemann sums here, it's the height of the rectangle that you run into trouble with. Right? In type one integrals, the Riemann sums couldn't be constructed because the width of the rectangles would be infinite. Here, it's the height of the rectangles, which could be infinite. Right? We have a challenge in constructing Riemann sums in the same sort of way. So this is also an improper integral. Uh, the, the kind of silly, or not silly, but easier way to think about it, any integral whose area could potentially be infinite, um, either because it's infinitely wide or infinitely tall, is automatically an improper integral. Uh, this problem was put on a competition that I took um, when I was a, a, a community college student, um, and I totally missed it. <laughs> they were, I was like, oh yeah, that's fucking easy. Just natural log stuff, it'll use cell, let's go. Um, and I, I totally missed the fact that it's an improper integral. It's very easy to miss that. And type two integrals are, for this reason, considerably more subtle, um, but they're not any harder to work with. The one thing here, let, um, instead, of, instead of going for the whole thing from one to three, let me just look at the integral from two to three carefully. Look carefully at this integral. I'll, I'll make this the example that we work to define the thing with. All right, we have the graph up there. I'm just going to sketch it again really quick here, shading only the region of interest. There's more reasons why we need to know our graphs, right? Um, if three is here, then this integral should be measuring this area, which because of the infinite height could be an infinite area. I cannot do the same sort of thing I did there, right? In the type one case, it would be like I chopped this here and took a limit to go up. I can't quite do that, right? I cannot chop this here because there's no like axis here and go up. Instead, what I do I drop and we'll call it A. It's the lower bound, A, here. And I calculate the integral from A to 3. And then I'm going to let A sneak over to 2 
from the right, it has to be a one-sided limit because I'm not interested in what's going on to the left of two. So I would say this is the limit as A goes to two from the right. Yeah, I'm letting this guy sneak in like that of the integral from A to three of one over X minus two dx. That's how we do this. So what we need to do is take our infinite region and kind of chop somewhere to guarantee we get a finite region that we can take the limit of to get the full region. And since the variable I have control over here, I don't have control over the variable y, I do have control over the variable x. So sort of the same spirit, right? Whichever one of these guys is giving you the problem, you're gonna replace by a parameter variable a, and then take a limit to send that thing where you want it to go. The one-sidedness of this limit is the thing that trips people up. So I'd like to, to take a second and make sure you're comfortable with why I'm talking only about the limit as a goes to two from the right and not from the left. So if a was over here to the left of two, then I'd be talking about some part of this region over here. That's not what I want. I'm really just trying to get this purple to expand and become all of this pencil. So the one-sidedness of these limits is important. The actual calculation here is not bad. Um, this is limit as A approaches two from the right. You do a little U sub here, a little micro U sub, and you get the natural log of x minus two. That's the values there, evaluated from a to three. Which is going to be the limit as a approaches two from the right. When I plug in three here for X, I get the natural log of the absolute value of three minus two, which is one. That's the natural log of one minus the natural log absolute value A minus two. LN one is zero again. So this is when A going to two from the right of the negative natural log. Now, a is going to two from the right, which means a is a little bigger than two. And if a is bigger than two, then a minus two is positive. So I can ditch the absolute values. And again, we need to think carefully about the natural log function to sort out this limit. So first, as a goes to two, where does a minus two go? All right, as a goes to two. To zero? Yeah, it goes to zero, right? Two minus two is zero. Uh, we do need to think about the one-sidedness. So as a goes to two from the right, is a minus two going to zero in a positive fashion or in a negative fashion? If you take a number a little bit bigger than two and you plug it in for a, is a minus two a small positive number or a small negative number? Small negative. So if a, think like 2.1, right? Then 2.1 minus two would be 0 0.1, which is small and positive. So as a goes to two from the right, a minus two goes to zero from the right. So the notation that we use in Calc 1 for this usually is a zero plus like this. Maybe I should put some parentheses here to make this a little bit easier to understand. 
And thinking about the graph of the natural log function again, as my inputs wander closer and closer to zero from the right, the natural log function is diving down to negative infinity. So the ln of zero plus is negative infinity. This is negative, negative infinity or positive infinity. So this integral we would say diverges. It doesn't look like the improper integrals we've seen before. This is a type two improper integral. And here's a divergent integral. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the, the kind of formal definition of a type two improper integral, and then I'll let you go. Next time we're going to talk about um, some theorems related to improper integrals. There's a, a kind of comparison theorem that exists, allowing you to sort out whether these converge or diverge without calculating them. And we'll get a little bit more practice with type twos and mixing type ones and type twos. But for now, today, let me just go ahead and give you the definition. All right, so these are type two improper integrals. If f of x has an infinite discontinuity, at x equals a, but is continuous on the open interval from a to b, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is a type two improper integral defined as the limit as x approaches, uh, I shouldn't use x, I'm so sorry. Um, we're gonna need some other parameter here. Limit as t approaches a from the right, integral uh, t to b. That's hideous, I'm so sorry. Integral t to b of f of x. It's just a mess today. Uh, and you can do this the other way if f has an infinite discontinuity at x equals b, but is continuous on the left closed right open interval, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So now we're discontinuous at the upper bound. So we would write this as the limit as t approaches b from the left of the integral from a to t f of x dx. So I have to use different symbols besides a and b for the limit here because a and b are concrete specific numbers. Um, I can't have limit b to something and I can't reuse the variable a x because that's already the variable of integration. So I'm using the symbol t. Um, when I taught this, we used use the symbol capital R for all of these things. You'll find different notations in the textbook um, and if you look around online. But these are type two improper integrals. That's where your function has an infinite discontinuity at one of the endpoints, right? And if that's the case, then what you need to do is sneak up on that endpoint, staying between A and B, which is why you have the one-sided limit. 
And again, if the limit exists and is finite, then we say the integral converges. If the integral, or if the limit fails to exist or fails to be finite, then we say the integral diverges. All right, this is the vibe. Um, the little picture that goes with each of these, I can draw a little something here for you. So here we had a discontinuity at A, which is the lower bound. Infinite discontinuity, meaning like a vertical asymptote. Maybe B is over here. And we're trying to get the area from A to B. And the way we do it is by chopping here at T, finding a formula for the area from T to B and then sending T back towards A from the right. In the second picture, I have an infinite discontinuity at the upper limit of integration, at the upper bound. Okay, something like this. And I'm trying to find the area from A to B again. And I'm after all of this potentially infinite area. And because I can't go all the way up to B, I chop somewhere to the left of B, find a formula for this stuff, and then let T creep up on B from the left. So the type two integrals, the picture is a little harder to understand and they're a little bit more subtle, but really there's nothing magic or special going on. In all of these, the idea is that you can potentially get an infinite area because the region is either infinitely long or infinitely tall. And if you are in that situation, you cannot build a Riemann sum for the integral as given. So you rewrite it as a limit of integrals for which you can build Riemann sums. Uh, yes, this will go on YouTube. I actually, I've got my thumb drive here with the stuff I pulled off the computer in our classroom. I'm starting to upload that too. The first three lectures now have the videos up and I will put this one up today. Question. Yeah. Uh, I, why did you put a, why did you represent the, the limit with a T there again? Uh, because the, most, the symbols A and B are already taken here. So in the type yeah. one integrals, one of your bounds was infinity. So I could say, oh, well, I'm going to call that B and let B go to infinity here. A and B are specific concrete numbers and those symbols are already spoken for. So I had to use a different symbol and I chose to use T. Okay, okay. I just wasn't sure if it was like something special I missed. No, you're good. I goofed here too. The first time I wrote it, I used the variable X, but then I realized, oh shit, we're already using X for something else. I can take a quick peek at what your book does for these. I actually, I forget what Stuart 8th edition does. I think they use T for this. Um, yeah, they go, they use T for everything here, right? They do, yeah. Uh, and then weirdly, your homework uses, like when you look at the little help me solve this things in the homework, they use a different notation. Um, but it's always the same sort of thing. You structure it as a limit. So in their definition for type two integrals, what do they do? Yeah, they use T again as well, yeah. Yeah, any other questions on this? All right, before I send you off into the world to start playing with these, your homework is up. I want to say just one last little thing. Um, if any part of an improper integral diverges, then so does the whole integral. Actually, I guess it's just more the one fact that I wanted to share here. The other stuff can wait. So remember we talked, we started this by looking at the integral from two to three, or sorry, from one to three of one over X minus two, which had that vertical asymptote at two. 
And so there was a problem on, on both sides. But then we calculated the integral from two to three and found that that was divergent. So the integral from one to three would automatically be divergent. Um, this is something that can show up in a number of other ways that is a little bit subtle. So remember, if any part of an improper integral diverges, the whole improper integral automatically diverges. In other words, you cannot subtract an infinity from an infinity and get zero. So this is something that we saw with the sine integral, right? We've got a lot of positive area and a lot of negative area. Just that positive area was infinite. So the whole thing would diverge automatically. Uh, the same thing is true of the integral from one to three that we started with here. Another fun one, set up the integral from negative infinity to infinity of just x. That's like an infinite triangle up here that's positive, an infinite triangle down here that's negative. And there are ways called symmetric integration that you can kind of start fooling yourself into thinking that's a convergent integral. Um, but using the definitions that we use in the standard conventions of mathematics, if any part of an improper integral diverges, we say the whole thing diverges. So that's it. I will go ahead and end here. We're a few minutes over. I'll stop. Um, I do have a normal office hour today. If you haven't taken the test yet, I know there are a few people who um, sick or needed more time or anything like that. Of course, that's fine. Um, just make sure that we're talking and we make some arrangements. Um, that is it. I'll have your test graded for you by next Monday. So um, yeah, if you want to talk about anything, come see me in office hours. Otherwise, you got some homework. Go ahead and get started on that. And I will see you guys on Friday. Okay.